Hey everybody, it's Christian Buckley with another post Tweet Jam takeaways. Uh, and I'm gonna do something a little bit different this time, this month. This is the 10th anniversary of the Collab Talk Tweet Jam. So I thought before I jump into the topic of what we did this month and just give you a summary, um, I, I, actually the artwork for this episode has a picture of me, uh, as well as uh, a photo of me from 10 years ago, uh, about the time that we started this. Uh, well, yeah. So, anywho, uh, why the Tweet Jam? So, this has been a question that I know a number of people have asked. I am regularly going out, kind of canvassing, talking to people, saying, hey, you should get involved in this. And so, that's why there's a, 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 a huge number of regulars as part of every Tweet Jam because people really enjoy the process. But every month, there's a handful of new people that are in. And of course, there's always lurkers people that participate. It is Twitter. It's a conversation. It's open to the community so anybody can get involved. Uh, but I just wanted to talk about like what, how this started. So as some of you may know my, from my history, I was working for an ISV in early 20, uh, 2012. Uh, that was actually when I earned my Microsoft MVP the first year, which is now you can see the wall. I'm a 10 year uh, MVP. Uh, but I wanted to break out of the echo chamber of my immediate community. And part of it was I was a SharePoint MVP. I was really embedded within that, the SharePoint community involved in the creation of migration and administration, you know, tools, governance tools for the SharePoint space. And I wanted to talk about topics around collaboration and not just have SharePoint people involved. I wanted to branch that out and regularly invite people in, including competitors to the Microsoft ecosystem. Because most of our topics, uh, while they're on SharePoint related technology, it's part of the conversation, uh, are bigger than that. It's not about the technology, it's about how we're using the technology and what's happening within our organizations. It's the small C collaboration discussion. So, of course, uh, didn't invent the concept of tweet jams. They've been going on you know, throughout Twitter, uh, within the Yammer community at that time, there's a lot of question, well, shouldn't you hold this in, in Yammer? And Yammer communities had created something called Yam Jams, which was created as part of Twitter. Uh, and But we wanted to be open. We didn't want it to be in a closed network where you had to go and register and sign up for that process to get into Yammer. We wanted it to be open to the world. Uh, and so we created that. And over the years, we fine-tune the model for this. Uh, like, how many questions do we ask? How long should it go? You know, the types of questions that we that we ask, and we've come up with this magic formula that just seems to work. It seems to be the right pace. It's very fast. When I've re removed, there's seven questions every time. When I've removed a question, it always seems to be slower. We tried that a number of times, uh, and so we went back to seven. Uh, so that's what that the, the tweet jam is. How do you participate? So I have kind of my, uh, you know, got the questions that we're going to cover. We have a topic uh, for the hour. It's always late in the month uh, at, at 9 a.m. Pacific, always at 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, apologies to the 4 a.m. people in Melbourne who just can't bring themselves to wake up to join. Occasionally we'll have folks from APAC that will jump in. Uh, but we do have people from all over the rest of the world that do join in. And so it's always interesting to see that. But uh, at the start of the Tweet Jam, uh, I kind of launched the, announced the topic. I have a bunch of cut and paste uh, you know, a, a, of different things that I go through, kind of guidance on how to participate. But essentially is everything that we do via Twitter. I usually have several Twitter pages open uh, so that I can see the live feed, everything around the collab talk hashtag, and I'm constantly refreshing that page so I see things, as well as a page for notifications where people repeat or they ask me questions, and then also a folder for direct messages. And so that's what I recommend people use. Back in the old days, the Twitter APIs actually allowed us to go and there was a Twitter feed API. Uh, Twitter ended that era. Uh, there are third-party tools that there's cool things that we could do, um, but we don't have that anymore. You can use Hootsuite or or uh, you know any of the other tools that are out there. I know people use Buffer and other tools to kind of manage their their visibility into the conversation. 
Uh, but as, as I go through, I give people an opportunity to introduce themselves. And then I post, I usually warm up. I said, here comes question one. And then I post Q1, question one, and post the question with the hashtag. And to respond, people put A1, answer one, uh, and they with the hashtag, and then they put their response in there. And it's important to always respond with the hashtag. That way, everybody who's following the conversation can see that it's in line, it's in context to the discussion that's happening. Even if somebody responds to your, your, uh, your response to question one, and they then don't include the hashtag or don't include the question number, if you respond back, answer to them, add that in again so we can kind of keep track of everything. And we go through that. I basically seven or eight minutes for each question over the course of the hour. Again, that seems to be the, 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 the pace. It's very fast. It can be very quick to see the conversations that go by. And there's no way that any of us can follow every line of conversation that happens. One of our sponsors is Tigraph. They provide tool set. It's all in Power BI. So at the end of every session, you can go in and on the last tab of the Power BI dashboard is every single tweet over that course of that hour using the Collab Talk hashtag. You can go through in order and review every response. So I always spend some time over the course of the rest of the day. I'm looking back through the responses finding gems, seeing what the side conversations were, some of the jokes, the memes, uh, what happens if we have a really active tweet jam, uh, we tend to trend nationally on Twitter and you start to see the bots pick it up. You see the advertisers jump in, utilizing the hashtag and promoting things in there, uh, which is always fun to see. But the output of this, why do I do this? Uh, why have I been doing it for 10 years? Uh, it, it's because one of the uh, kind of the, the, the reasons for starting it in the first place, as I mentioned, was to to break out of the echo chamber of the people that I was working with day in and day out and get other ideas. I wanted to validate ideas. I wanted to hear other opinions, get other perspectives. I don't think any topic that I've done for ten years, there's there's always some response from someone within the community that I never thought of. Uh, and so it's great to have that perspective. As a content generator, I get ideas for videos and blog posts. I, I push ideas to my teams. I also see, based on the responses, I reach out to people and say, hey, would you like to do a video? Or would you like to do a guest blog post? Or hey, would you like to collaborate on an idea around this? And so I'm sharing that information and strengthening the relationships that I have out in the community and building new relationships. And so extending that social network. It's also just a great way because people provide links to other articles, to other to books and white papers and research and companies that are out there. And so that's fantastic to get those resources as well. Uh, and in, uh, I guess the, the number one idea uh, uh, benefit of participating is it, it allows me to share my ideas and expand on those things. So again, as a content creator, I'm looking for validation of some of my ideas, get some refining ideas in there, um, but then to be able to go and if I have an idea around an article or a new session that I wanna give at a conference. And so it, it's a great way for me to kind of break the ice and get that initial feedback. So that's why I started that. That's what uh, the, how you participate in the Tweet Jam. Again, it's wide open to anyone. So if you ever see a Tweet Jam topic, if I'm talking about it, if you're able to join, just mark it on your calendar. Uh, let Reach out to me and say, hey, this is something I'm an expert in or I'm passionate about. I'd love to participate. I'm happy to add you, add, to add new names to the panel. So just reach out to me and connect. So for this month, for the 10th anniversary, we discuss the topic of objectives, key results, and the employee experience. And so that, of course, I we dig a little bit into the questions. I'll go through here in a second, um, but cover Microsoft's recent acquisition of Ally.io, which is an OKR or Objectives Key Results technology company. And they're adding that solution into their Microsoft Viva platform, which is part of their broader uh, employee experience effort, you know, that initiative. So EXP, of course, is not a Microsoft thing. It's a focus on 
you know, end users on employees and making sure that their end to end experience and whatever it is that, that you, you know, they're, they're doing over the course of their day that we're thinking about that ISVs, that solution providers like Microsoft, like my company Avpoint are thinking about that end to end, you know, end user experience and whether we're providing the end to end experience or just a piece of that experience that we understand the, what the customer needs is the end to end. And so even if we're just a little piece of that experience, we need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to make that end to end experience exactly what the customer needs and to work with all of the other players that in that continuum that are part of that experience and looking at not just what people are doing. So the technology that they, they purchase a piece of software, they're out there utilizing the capabilities. That's not just what it's about, but it's whether they're being productive, whether they're being efficient, whether they're happy, are they getting burned out in this activity? And so what can we do to, uh, to have longevity in the solutions that we provide as well? So I know there's a lot more to it than that, I'm just trying to provide kind of a synopsis, but that's what the employee experience EXP is. And having shared objectives, shared goals, uh, shared outcomes as part of your organizational planning is something that in my experience, a lot of organizations fail at. I started my career early on, I spent a number of years, about a third of my career um, in the project and portfolio management space. So. Uh, task management, task tracking, project planning, um, all those kinds of things. The portfolio view would be multiple projects and having kind of a global view of time and people and resource management, kind of all those components. Did that for a number of years and what my, my path into collaboration, into knowledge management space, into the SharePoint world and, and now the Microsoft 365 ecosystem um, was through project and portfolio management. In fact, my first Microsoft deployment, technology deployment, I'd used the Office apps and things before, um, but my first deployment was actually Project Server back in 2004, 2005, uh, and with that, an early version, uh, a free version of SharePoint, and a year, year and a half later, I was working at Microsoft in what is now part of Office 365. So I kind of caught the bug, I caught the vision of what it could be, although my project server experience wasn't that great. But uh, even then, a big part of that project and portfolio management was, it's a key to success of a lot of those solutions were those that had like an OKR component. The ability for, at the top level, a company to come in and say, hey, here are three pillars of what we're trying to accomplish this year to move forward. These are our three big items that we're focusing on for the fiscal year for our company. Then the next level down is each business unit needs to be able to say, well, here's the five things we need to do. And all five of these drive towards achieving that top three. And then you have the team level down to the individual level. The idea is that we have a shared understanding of what is it that we're trying to accomplish as a company and that I as an individual understand how the tasks that I'm doing on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual basis drive towards all the way up to those top line goals or objectives, those desired outcomes as a company. So having tooling to do that, and that's the, the project and portfolio management side that I, that I worked on, but even then a missing piece of a lot of that, that technology was the actual the the objectives the the results the outcomes uh, and so it's just a different way of thinking and planning and making sure that people are on the same page and we're working towards the same goals and and because we have that shared understanding those shared goals and they're measurable they're traceable through the organization then we can measure those things and know well how close are we to achieving our goals, what are our stretch goals? How do we go above and beyond what those goals are? So that's that's this space. I'm very excited that Microsoft is, uh, it's been, a, I think, a gap uh, in Microsoft's technology. Uh, and so I'm, I'm excited to see them do that. I'd love them to fix some of the problems. This is a longer discussion around their project management software. Um, we could have a discussion about that Microsoft, Call me.
uh, we can talk about that. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's movement in task management. Um, I'm just not seeing it yet, unfortunately. But back to the, the focus of this, OKRs. Um, so here's the questions that we discuss. And I'll just I'll run through these very quickly and share some of my thoughts and just wrap this up. And you can always go on Twitter and do a search on the collab talk hashtag. And just over, uh, it, was, it was January 25th was the event date. And you can search, you can find all of this, as well as I'll have a link to the Tigraph stats. So you can go into Power BI and you can go see every single tweet that was sent out and all of the sentiment analysis and other information of who participated. I think we had 31, 31 active tweeters uh, for this discussion. So just a lot of great content that's within that. So the first one, so what are your key employment experience goals for 2022 and beyond? I can tell you organizationally ours is to, uh, so we were actually moving forward with, we were looking at ally.io prior to Microsoft acquiring them. Uh, so that is actually something that's on our calendar year plans as a company is to deploy that, start using that. And so that we can have better alignment um, by team, by business unit, and all the way up, roll up to the top levels of the organization. So a key part of our experience is to do a better job of getting everybody on the same page so that we know as individuals what we're working on, how that impacts what the, the business is trying to achieve, which I think is just so important, especially having just gone public last year. Um, we have huge growth plans. Our revenues is growing. The number of products that we're releasing is growing. We're moving into new areas. And so it's important that we're all on the same page. Uh, the second question we discuss is, what is your company's internal management approach or culture for goal setting uh, objectives and ta task execution? So I'd say we're, it's kind of a mixed bag. I'll be honest, uh, you know, without getting into detail around it, uh, there is, you know, we're a very flat, uh, organization. Uh, a, a lot of the ownership, the responsibility falls on the individuals. We try to hire the smartest people possible. And so we expect them to own and go and drive and shape their own career uh, to ask for help when they need it, those kinds of things. But I do see, and while it, we uh, do a great job of communication, uh, especially during the pandemic, we're constantly you know, meetings when there need to be, but a lot of just one-on-one -on -one conversations, a lot of chat that's happening. People aren't shy, uh, and so they reach out and connect. But we are lacking in that clear-cut, top-level, down to each business unit, down to each organization, to the team level, to the individuals. And it'll be great to have that kind of structure, that kind of alignment. So we'll have very clear areas of what we own and when we go above and beyond it'll be easier as an individual contributor it's easier for you to go and show that you're going above and beyond when everything is clearly defined because if there's no definition of success how do you know you've succeeded if there's no definition of success of what we're trying to achieve how can you go above and beyond there's no measurement you can always just claim that it's it's a project management uh, a term called scope creep. Um, that happens when you have no definition, it gets defined for you. Uh, so three, so that's that's kind of the culture. So it's just kind of open, people talk, um, but we could use more structure. Uh, three, how does your organization connect the work that people do every day to broader company object objectives and outcomes? As I said, it's, it's meeting culture, um, we do have, I mean, we, we do a good job of on part of our monthly uh, uh, discussions, company-wide town halls of here's what's going on, here's what's changing, here's what we need to focus on. And the leadership, the VPs, the GMs, and the directors do a good job of translating that down to the teams. But as we get bigger, we're close to 2,000 employees. I mean, it's, it's going to be untenable to, to do just that method. We have to have it documented. There needs to be some level of automation in place. It's easier when you're a small organization, um, but, you know, kind of a management 101. I mean, the, the, the most effective team size is a manager with five direct reports. 
Um, I don't know where I read that. That's that's my MBA speaking. Um, but I know in my own experience, when I had five to eight employees, I was the more, more most effective. When I had more employees, I've managed up to 40, 50 people directly. Um, that was very difficult to go and do. Needed to put some structure in, in, in place around that. But, you know, so how can you understand all of the tasks, all of the objectives, all of the desired outcomes of every one of those employees. The more people you have, the more complex that it gets. So um, we're doing everything via chat. We've got plans. We've used some planner, some other task management. I've never seen a, a Gantt chart, any kind of formal project management tools to that degree. Uh, it, a lot of PowerPoint, uh, but it's just through through those discussions. Like I know what my individual commitments are. I talk with man, my manager, we've agreed to that. And so every time we meet, I'm basically running through, here's my high level commitments. So in some ways I'm, I'm essentially doing what the technology um, can provide. We're just going to get better at it. Number four was how do you work within or change a company culture that is task focused instead of objective focused. I, you know, there were um, a number of people who responded to the sayings like, is that, is it either or? Can't we be both of those things? Yeah, no, it, it's not meant to be. A, a lot of the questions that I, the way I pose them is I, I want them to be open. Sometimes I want them to be like people to question the question itself and have discussion around that. It's up to interpretation around what that means. Um, one way of, of looking at this are some people are just so focused on, uh, you know, like task driven, they kind of lose sight of, you know, the, the, of the forest. The, you know, what is it? You, the, who's the forest for the trees? You know, anyway, there's a saying that's out there somewhere. But, uh, you know, we're so focused down on our work that we lose the perspective. Uh, and sometimes it's great to have the perspective, but it never translates into the, the, the tasks of what people actually do. You would need to have both of those things. You need to have the high level uh, objectives, but you need to have the day-to-day -day tasks. People, um, not that I'm a, I'm not a believer in the ticket taking approach to, uh, to most things. People should have, I'm a, much more of a, here's what I need you to go and do. Here's the time frame for that. Here's the success metrics. It's up to you on how you go and do that, whether you're working at your desk, whether you're working from a table in the cafeteria surrounded by people, you're working from a hot desk in the middle of the support org, or you're working from home in, in this, this era. You know, it's irrelevant if you're achieving the goals, if, you're, if we're getting the desired outcomes as the company. Um, so a big part of this is looking at, you know, our, how much are we focused on the tasks? Are we losing sight of the goals or vice versa? Uh, and make sure that it's a balance of those things. How do you work within your organization to change the culture around that? Um, one of the things I talked about, I've experienced at three companies now where I've done, stood up like a daily scrum. And again, this is something where as me as a people manager with a small team, it's difficult to do with a larger organization and be effective. But for smaller working teams uh, is to, uh, to do this on a regular basis, especially if you're in a fast paced environment, a lot of changes, constant barrage of customers you know, coming in with new requests and you're constantly having to reprioritize things. Here, this you can tell I, that I've worked in uh, operations organizations, support organizations, in, in IT project management uh, uh, type organizations where there's constantly those requests coming in with a limited number of personnel of engineers and project managers and analysts to be able to go and solve these issues. You're constantly prioritizing based on who's asking them for the request, what's the urgency of this project, what's the dollar of value that's attached to it, and you are then applying resources to these things based on those priorities. And so you, you need to, um, you need to have communication, open communication. You need to be clear on the process. When I did the daily scrums, um, so I did this at, uh, well, again, a couple companies. Um, one, just before I joined Microsoft, I did it again when I was at Microsoft, 
where I did, I instituted daily standing meetings where I literally stood in the hall. I did at both locations. I installed a whiteboard on the wall in a central area and said it's mandatory, people must be there in the morning. It wasn't meant to be a permanent thing, but it was an opportunity for us to get together and restate, here's what we're working towards, here's the high priority things, here's all the new requests that have come in, let's talk about the, the prioritization of these new requests, the status of the existing requests. And the consistency of having that discussion, it developed the team culture and then spread out to our customer groups who could see and they built, they built trust into our process. They knew that when they were asking us for help on things, that we went through this process, we reviewed it, we considered it. When we came back with our ETA of delivering uh, the, the, the results that we would, you know, that was based on everything else that's going on out there, with all of our priorities, and we were thoughtful about that process. So we built trust within that process. So that's what has to happen to, to make change happen. You have to be clear on what the goals, what the objectives are, have a process, communicate that, and then be consistent in sticking to that process and, and keeping it open. So people would, were very understanding when they would come in and would ask for, you know, hey, hey, I need this, this is a huge priority. And we'd look at it and say, well, look, it's a lesser priority than the ones that we have in, but you're the next on the list. And as soon as we deliver on these others, then we'll put personnel on this one or standard project management. We could, if you had more funds, we could take action. If you have personnel you could give us, we could move forward on it. Nope, can't do either of those things. All right, all right. well, then that's the priority around that. We built trust in that where people understood, it. even if they weren't happy with the answer, they knew that it was thoughtful that we you know, that we took into consideration kind of all those different things. That there was a reason why the ETA given was, you know, something that was reasonable. If people are involved in the process, if they understand the process, they are more likely to support the process. If, you, if it's a black box, if they don't understand the reasoning, the thinking of why you push their, their request down in priority, priority then they're going to push back. They're going to complain or more likely they will go around you. Uh, number five was how does or would an OKR objectives and key results solution fit into your employee experience plans? So I've talked about it fits into ours because it's just the next step. We're moving so quickly. We're growing that we need to make sure that everybody is working on the same page, that we're driving towards the same objectives, the same goals. And so that's something where I think even if you're an organization with 10 people, you can still benefit from this strategy. I would argue you may not need to go buy a tool or look at some of the free options that are out there, but if you, as you start to get more automated, to be able to have the links to the project, to the task activities as well. So you have the high level objectives down to the day-to-day -day tasks that need to be done and make all the assignments and have people report back and track their activity. Um, tools are great for that. That's the things that they can do well. So it, it fits into our employee experience plans because we understand that we need to have tighter management of those plans and the outcomes and our progress against them. So we're just at that stage naturally. Uh, number six, does Microsoft's acquisition of OKR solution provider ally.io alter your plans around Microsoft Viva? No. Well, for us, I mean, we're in the Microsoft ecosystem. It's the primary partner that we work with. Um, although we work with uh, Google and Salesforce and, and other clouds, um, but Microsoft is our number one. Um, and we're doing more and more around Viva. We have ideas for other products. We have other solutions. We have things that we do that support Microsoft Viva and Ally just fits right into that. So we're going to be using it as a customer. Uh, and then you know, we can't use a solution uh, out of the Microsoft ecosystem without then also looking at it from a partner perspective of what can we do to improve this? And for our customers, what else can we do? Are there other gaps that we can fill? Because that's what we do, we're product people. And then the last question is, what feedback would you give Microsoft on their employee experience strategy so far? Well, 
No, I think you could dive into each of the pillars, the existing pillars, um, and there is there's probably some feedback around each of those areas. I think overall, I mean, Microsoft is uh, is moving forward on this strategy at the right time. I think just where we are in the market, um, it, you know, hopefully not too much longer, but here in the era of the pandemic, where organizations are looking at uh, you know employee burnout and they're looking at it's not just hey, are we productive? Are we efficient in the work that we're doing? But we're having a high level of burnout. Um, are people feeling like they're getting the most out of you know, their experience? Are they, is there balance in their lives? And so having these different solutions that allow organizations to get a better overall sense of the health and well-being, productivity and effectiveness um, of their employees will lead to a healthier relationship between employee and employer and that's a good thing so i'd say microsoft can probably do a, a better job around the overall packaging of you know the the story around viva i think that there's a lot more that can be done there but it's just where we are it's still kind of early and it's it is it's still a new thing um, some of the feedback that was given, I know that um, probably the strongest level of displeasure with Microsoft Viva is uh, the licensing issues. Um, I think most people would love to see all the capabilities uh, available through the main, most mainstream licenses like the E3, E5 licenses. Not having to go and pay additional for premium services for a lot of this capability. The only thing I would say about that is that, like uh, Fast Search, is a great example of that. Where initially it was, uh, you know, a side solution you paid extra. Then it was a premium service, is more integrated, but you still paid for. And now you have, while there are still search solutions, you can go above and beyond. The majority of the technology has been integrated into SharePoint Search, and that is is there. So I think just over time that's going to constantly change and evolve but people would love to see that with something as powerful as this and what viva could be that it was more of an integrated license that was just tacked on to the solutions that we already have today so that's kind of my takeaways from uh from the the tweet jam this month uh once again if you'd like to get involved uh, just follow me on twitter at at buckley planet you can check out the the videos the summaries of past the past 10 years of the tweet jams you can find it out on my blog and on buckleyplanet.com uh, and it, whenever you see a topic if it's of interest reach out to me and connect everybody's invited so with that thanks for watching and uh have a great rest of your month oh yeah oh and we're back by the way February 22nd, 2022 will be the next Collab Talk Tweet Jam. So uh, 9 a.m. Pacific on February 22nd. See you there.